All right. Welcome to our classic episode, fellow conspiracy realists. Everybody knows that Egypt has pyramids, but what you may not know is that there are other pyramids all around the world built by all sorts of civilizations. Why? What we found is that there are a lot of folks who will tell you they were part of a global network, and there are a lot of other folks who will just say, hey, a pyramid is literally one of the most stable things you can build. It's a good point. It also, uh, speaking of a point, it's got a good point uh, that potentially points to God or funnels some sort of magical godlike energy. You know, a lot of fun conjecturing in this episode. Well, yeah, Graham Hancock has his new show on Netflix right now as we record this intro talking about the ancient apocalypse and the possibility that there was some kind of advanced civilization before the Great Flood. You know, this this is really all food for thought in here for this episode. Mm, yum, yum. Yeah. And just to say, you know, um, you will you will find that uh, Graham Hancock's uh, Netflix show has met with no small amount of controversy. So we we do our best here uh, to try and look at both the claims that people are making and the uh, conclusions of archaeologists. So let us know which side you fall on in this great debate. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. You are you. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. We've got our super producer Tristan there on the, uh, let's see, ones, twos. We got a whole stable of super producers now. I feel like the name has taken on less of a special meaning. Are you just mad because I called you a super producer first? Yeah, I am. Okay. What am I now? An inferior producer? You're a super co-host. Oh, that's sweet. Okay. Yeah. So it's true. We have been expanding, and we're hoping to build something that stands the test of time. Uh-oh. Uh-huh. Which turns out is a fairly tricky endeavor the longer the timeline becomes, right? I, I hear the trick is to stack things uh, on the ground and then stack another layer that's slightly smaller on top of that one, and then just keep going. It's the old Lego rule. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or uh, from red solo cups to uh, decks of cards. You know, this is such a side note, but I had no idea. Uh, apparently, red solo cups or solo cups in general are a U.S. thing, mm. and they've appeared in so many films that people around the world associate it with American culture. So people travel traveling to the U.S. from outside of the U.S., often buy these cups wow. and bring them back to their friends. And associate them with getting plastered. Sort of like pyramids in Egypt, am I right? Yes, sort of <laughs> like pyramids in Egypt. Uh, that is true. That's what we are. We sort of circumnavigated the uh, <laughs> the topic. And so let's get right to it. Let's jump into the bush instead of beating around it. Pyramids. Well, you may have seen one of these things before, perhaps in a history book. Perhaps you've taken a trip to somewhere in the world where they exist It's a structure with a triangular outer surface, like we were talking, uh, smaller layers on top of bigger ones, and it converges to a single point at the top. Now hold your horses, kids, because we're about to get into some serious geometry. The base of a pyramid can be trilateral, quadrilateral, or any polygonal shape. You guys remember that stuff? Oh, Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't. So let's look at a square pyramid. A square pyramid has a base, four triangular outer surfaces. This is a common version and uh, the design is simple but brilliant right a uh, pyramid keeps the majority of the structure's weight closer to the ground and uh the pyramidion on top that's the fancy word for a capstone means that less material higher up on the pyramid will be pushing down from above so mm-hmm. these are structurally very very stable and when early civilizations created these uh, they quickly realized 
you know, this is way more durable than just building straight up the way we do with skyscrapers. Right? Yeah. And we can build these things much larger than any other building that we've created thus far. And they're cool looking. Yeah, it's true. And let's be honest. When most people hear the word pyramid, they don't really think of geometry, quadrilaterals and polygons. They think of mummies and Egypt. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's I'm, being, totally. I'm super basic. <laughs> That's I mean, you're totally right. They think of they think of Egypt, pharaohs, mm -hmm. mummies, right? And, and who can blame them? Egypt has a huge amount of pyramids. The estimates vary, but sources currently cite anywhere from 88 to 138 identified pyramids. And there could be more hiding out underneath something, which we this will be a common thing that we find throughout this episode. Yeah, I mean, most of these, right, I no, I think you're spot on to mention mummies because most of the ones in Egypt were built as tombs. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the uh, it was the very last word in luxury. And these were common during the old and middle kingdom periods. The earliest known pyramids are found in a place northwest of Memphis. Memphis in Egypt. Mm -hmm. The Memphis in Tennessee is named after the Memphis in Egypt, mm -hmm. which I, I didn't know for a long time. But uh, the, it's an old town called uh, Saqqara. The earliest of these pyramids is the Pyramid of Djoser, D-J-O-S-E-R, uh, and it was built during the Third Dynasty. In this pyramid and its surrounding complex, I guess you could say it's almost like a kind of compound where everything's sort of built around it, like a mall or something. Mm -hmm. um, they were designed by the architect Imhotep, and they're generally considered to be the world's oldest monumental structures uh, constructed of what's called dressed masonry. So not like a, not like a earthen mound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're more polished and mm -hmm. finished stones, right? Mm -hmm. And by far the most famous pyramids that exist. When you close your eyes and you imagine a pyramid, you're probably Doing thinking, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, what are you seeing? It's probably the pyramids at Giza. The, on the outskirts of Cairo, Egypt, these have been featured all over the place uh, since you were a baby. That these, have, <laughs> these things have been on covers of magazines and on television and in movies. And they're some of the largest structures ever built. The largest one at Giza, the largest pyramid, is the Pyramid of Khufu. And, as remember, the seven wonders of the ancient world, Ooh. the hanging gardens, all mm -hmm. that jazz. Uh, the Pyramid of Khufu is the only one still in existence. That's so a cool. pretty serious uh, accomplishment for a structure, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not surprised they beat the garden, but any any man-made structure, you've probably seen this in various uh, non-fiction television shows where they talk about what would happen if humans just disappeared or when the species goes extinct, mm -hmm. you start talking about how quickly things will deteriorate. Uh, the U.S. has a couple of durable structures, but not as many as we think. No. The Hoover Dam is pretty pretty cool. That thing is still curing. It's technically not finished. <laughs> That's an odd thought. But the pyramids will probably outlast uh, a lot of the architecture that's currently on the planet. And for thousands and thousands of years, these were the largest man-made structures on Earth. For example, let's take a closer look at the Pyramid of Khufu, which is built mainly of limestone in the exterior and most of the pyramid itself. But then as you get towards the interior, there are some large red granite blocks in there. Yeah, and it contains over 2 million blocks, and they have a wide range of weight, but uh, they're they're all gigantic mm -hmm. uh the large limestone blocks uh weighed 6.5 to 10 tons wow and the smaller ones would weigh in at about 1.3 tons Jeez. and so um you can see various calculations of this it, there's another thing it's not just the size and the weight of this structure uh the placement is surprisingly precise right uh it has four sides that face the four cardinal points absolutely, as you said, precisely. And it also has an angle of 52 degrees. Uh, originally, it was 488 feet high, but today, uh, I guess through pyramid shrinkage, the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the well-known and documented phenomenon, it's only 455 feet. So what happened to that missing 33 feet? Somebody stole it. Right. It wasn't erosion. Nature didn't steal it. People stole it. There was this high-quality casing limestone. So pyramid shrinkage, not a thing? 
Well, uh, I guess in the way that retail stores refer to shoplifting as shrinkage. Spoilage, right? <laughs> I, I heard shrinkage. Spoilage might be one, too. But nonetheless, this thing still remains as a massive structure out there in the desert, or at least on the outskirts of a city. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. And when we hear this word again, we we often think of ancient Egypt, one of the world's most influential situations, tombs, desert, mystery, winds in the night and curses. Right. Uh, pyramids are mysterious, though. For hundreds of years, societies around the world forgot what they were for, had no idea why they were built, would just take tours to stare at them mm -hmm. and then to steal stuff. And to be fair. There are a lot of human beings out there that don't believe we've nailed down exactly what these pyramids are for, even though, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, even though it's kind of a known thing, but we're going to, we're going to get into it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's a precedent for pyramids. The earliest proven precedents for pyramids are called ziggurats and they, they're not in Egypt. Instead, the earliest ziggurats were located in Mesopotamia. So when you, just if you're thinking about what Mesopotamia is, if you're not going back to those high school classes, uh, it's Iraq, Syria, uh, a couple other countries right in the Middle East there that goes through the Tiber Euphrates River. It's uh, the cradle of civilization, right? It's where massive. The Fertile Crescent? Yes, but it's where massive war is being waged right now. And that's why it was the cradle of civilization, because it was very supportive of you know, growing crops and it was, you know, within all that desert, it was a sort of an oasis. I it's guess, great or, soil. Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And we see that we see different civilizations springing up around uh, fertile deltas, you know, in the convergence of rivers. Silt. Silt. Yeah. It's all about the silt. Uh, so the earliest cigarettes are toward the end of what's called the early dynastic period. And the Latest or most recent ones date from the 6th century B.C. They were all the rage. And they weren't, uh, you know, they, they used to look way cooler. They were uh, brightly painted in gold and bronze. But since they're constructed from these sun-dried mud bricks, over time they've decayed. Can you imagine rolling up in a somewhat desert area and seeing like a gold-covered giant building that's just reflecting sun directly back at itself, back at the sun? And at your face? I would assume that I was, my life was in mortal danger and whomever built it was going to sacrifice me. I'd be like, that's pretty dope. But yeah, especially if you're talking the, what you said, the latest ones were 6th century. Mm. Yeah, mm. and just imagine the technology available, the understanding of the world at the time. Well, that's a big thing with pyramids even today is like people are like, how did they manage to hoist these blocks? And they're mm. still, you know wild speculation as to different methods that they could have used. And mm -hmm. some of those include help from extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. And ziggurats were also built by the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Elamites, the Akkadians, and the Assyrians, typically for local religions. And as, as we mentioned earlier, these didn't exist in a vacuum. Each one was part of a larger complex. So there would be a place for, storage there might be a place where a priest lives and in various other buildings with some bureaucratic functions some support functions and some official proceedings and by official i guess in this case we mean like religious or governmental proceedings for sure and when we talk about how these things are structured we discussed a pyramid which is you know more of that traditional structure that you imagine of a sloping side even though it's not you know, perfect, you're still dealing with layers of blocks. When you think about a ziggurat, it's a little more of a tiered system. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're looking at it, you're going to see some kind of base. So it's either rectangular, oval, some like perhaps a square. Mm -hmm. And then the pyramidal structure is similar, but it's just divided more as you go up. Well, that's the thing too. The ziggurats are obviously super cool to look at as well, but construction and engineering wise, a little more straightforward, right? Almost like building a brick wall, like, or a, a brick staircase, whereas the pyramids are like smooth and like to actually do the math and figure out how to get those blocks just the right size to slide in there and have it be structurally sound and also make those amazing sloping, perfectly flat sides. That's, that's where the real mystery kind of comes in. It's like, man, how did you even conceive this? Yeah. That's the thing. The, 
where you had the capstone with a pyramid with these ziggurats, you have more of a flat top. Mm -hmm. So you could do things at the top of a ziggurat. Like sacrifice virgins. Sure. Mm -hmm. If if that's uh, if that's what your religion dictates. Or just sacrifice, you know, whomever. Yeah, yeah. A lamb could be just a lamb. It could be a lamb. It could be a king. It could be the child of a king, depending on the weather. It was a different time. It was. <laughs> it was a different time. Uh, there's another thing here that I thought was was interesting, and, and it's a, a practice that you can see even in the modern day. Kings sometimes had their names on the bricks, and it makes me think of various public works and parks where people donate to a cause. Sure. Right? Like in uh, we have a thing in Atlanta called Centennial Park, and there are these huge swaths of 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 cobblestone or or brick where uh people have people during the olympics paid some sort of fee to have a brick with their name on it Mm -hmm. you seen that episode of curb your enthusiasm where it's like anonymous he's really upset that he gets his name put in a wing of a museum and then the other guy's anonymous and it turns out it's ted danson but he keeps telling everybody that it's him (laughs) yeah (laughs) he's so humble and cool and chill because it's like anonymous for the for me, it reminds me of presidential libraries or something, totally. where it just has your name across the mm-hmm. top emblazoned there. Mm-hmm. I'd make mine anonymous. Yeah, people. I mean, people do a lot of stuff to just to get their name on something. Yeah, you know, maybe a hotel, maybe a hotel downtown Manhattan. Sure. I mean, I do this <laughs> podcast just so I can maybe one day end up like on a T-shirt. <laughs> there you go. So, all right. So we we can see then the most famous examples also. Pyramids and ziggurats, the, the comparison I always think of, you guys, we talked about Legos earlier, we mentioned that. You remember Duplos? Mm-hmm. Duplo is like Ooh, the, the uh, less sophisticated version of Legos. I think their age range is a little younger. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. The little, the little, the little rabbit. The mm-hmm. little red rabbit. Is yeah, yeah. Logo. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's, that's what I always think of because it's like you're building ziggurats and then you've upgraded to pyramids. Ah. Right. Yep. 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 Matt don't know about Duplo. I don't know about Duplo. So you don't I'm know sorry. about Duplo, man. No, but I'll learn. Oh, you'll or learn. remember. Maybe I don't know. I think I think you got the concept, though, right? I understand. They're yeah. big Legos. It was an apt metaphor, Ben. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. it really does Thank make you. sense. Over over the centuries, you know, people have, as we said, speculated endlessly about the pyramids. Uh, some theories range from. Nearly certain, widely accepted in mm-hmm. academic circles, and then some get uh, further and further out there to the fringes and beyond. But today we're going to ask a question a lot of listeners have asked us over the years. Yet we know a lot about the Egyptian pyramids. They're literally people called Egyptologists who spend their lives studying this stuff. But what about all those other pyramids? Oh, yeah. They're in other places. And we'll get to that right after a quick sponsor break. Here's where it gets crazy. There are other pyramids. It's not just ziggurats in the ancient cradle of civilization. So that the- wasn't like an empty tease? No, no, we're going to deliver. It turns out, you see... Uh, This might come as a surprise to some people, but the ancient world was actually chock full of pyramids, lousy with them on continents across the planet. And they're not all these tombs to some god king that, you know, sat above all the rest of the citizenry and, you know, dictated what to do. Uh, There were temples. A lot of them were temples. Some cases, they're sites of human sacrifice. And we know that because we found the evidence. Uh, But we still don't know how many existed or even still exist today. But in 2013, archaeologists actually discovered 35 pyramids in a Sudanese necropolis that dated back around 2,000 years when a kingdom named Kush mm, flourished in Sudan. And that's insane. 2013. Yeah. 2013, we're still finding pyramids. And these in particular were pretty, pretty darn interesting because... They're really closely together, the way they're, you know, they're located, they're concentrated, right? And they're pretty big, larger than an NBA basketball court. And, you know, it's so surprising to me that you can just discover this just because the sand has moved Mm -hmm. so much over Mm -hmm. such a period of time that they got covered up and you can't see them anymore. 
sometimes there's growth on top of them that you have to basically just dig away and then, oh, there they are. You've heard of these, I'm sure, the Mayan pyramids that exist in Mesoamerica. Mm -hmm. Technically, they're ziggurats and were used for human sacrifice. I guess when I was conjuring the image of virgin sacrifices, I was maybe thinking more along the Mayan lines. You know, uh, it's it's not far. It's not far off because a lot of the in Mesoamerica and Aztec and, and Mayan culture, there were religious sites, but there is also documented human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times these sacrifices might involve um, prisoners of war. So Aztec parties at least would send out raiding parties to wage war with these really brutal, crazy. Have you seen what was sort of the analog of a sword in that culture? It was like this wooden slat with these obsidian chips. Ooh. Yeah. Terribly sharp. Frightening. Uh, did you ever see that movie Apocalypto? Do you I, remember that one? I still haven't seen that. I still haven't seen The Passion of the Christ. Oh, jeez. I also have not seen The Passion of the Christ. Oh, man, me neither. Well, that's why I haven't seen Apocalypto, because <laughs> it just struck me as kind of like taking that movie to Mesoamerica. I mean, it's it's got the similar kind of, you know, brutal gore mm -hmm. and violence that I don't usually go for. You wouldn't think that, but I'm a little bit sensitive about that kind of stuff. It's a, you know, Apocalypto, I thought was a, a great film. I can't speak to the passion of the Christ because I have, I did see part of it. So, uh, Satan makes a couple of appearances and I went on YouTube and watched those parts. Is it like played by like a, an actor? Is he in makeup or something? No, it's the devil. Really? No, yeah. They, they got him on for, no, no, yeah. I just mean like, is it just like a dude? Like a. It's, Are we uh, allowed to spoil Passion of the Christ? Is that impossible? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, it's an ambiguous figure, but it's not all fire and brimstone, at least from the stuff I saw. There might be another segment of the film where there are like wings sprouting and Al Pacino comes out and is like, who are you carrying all those bricks for, Kevin? God? That's Devil's Advocate. I That's think. a good film. I love that one. Well, there are also pyramids in Nigeria. Now, these are ones that I was not aware of. But uh, upon looking into it, it turns out that the Nasud pyramids mm -hmm. uh, at the Nigerian town of Nasud um, in northern Igbo land uh, were, in fact, a thing. Uh, ten pyramidal structures were built of clay and mud, much like the early ziggurats we talked about. Um, and the first base section was 60 feet in circumference and three feet in height. The next stack was 40 feet in circumference. And then you had these circular stacks that continued up, um, almost like a chimney stack kind of look at the top. Mm -hmm. And then you had those going on until you got to the very top of the structure. Uh, these were temples for the god Allah or Uto, uh, who was believed to reside at the top. Um, and a stick was placed at the top to represent the God's residence, sort of like, you know, putting an angel on a Christmas tree. Yeah, that's a really good analogy mm -hmm. or a really good comparison. There were also pyramids in Spain. Yeah, there are some more recent ones that were that are thought to have come from the 19th century. They look like ziggurats, but they they appear to be just agricultural techniques. Um, but, you know, that's not a 100 percent sure kind of thing mm -hmm. but then you go to a gentleman gentleman named manuel abril that thinks he's discovered something even bigger yes manuel abril is an amateur archaeologist and uh, you might say an armchair archaeologist if you want to call a turkey a bird about it uh other professional archaeologists sort of dismissed him as an amateur at times so he believes that uh, it, he found uh, – this got reported in 2016. He believes that he discovered a huge ancient building buried beneath undergrowth in Spain. Uh, it's on the outskirts of a town called Canete, and it's believed to be the first uh, monolithic structure discovered in the country. Uh, yeah, if you look at it, it looks like a hill mm -hmm. that maybe has a little more structure to it, a little more pointed than you'd normally see in a you know a naturally forming – hill of that sort mm -hmm. um but you know it's it's pretty compelling but it's not uh, as of this point it hasn't been verified correct <laughs> right so for hundreds of years locals thought this was just a natural formation mm -hmm. you know the eternal question is that a pyramid or a hill <laughs> right uh but this guy's making claims uh we were waiting to see how they develop uh he's making claims that this earthwork conceals a gigantic structure, and it would be 
a tremendous deal if it turned out that Europe had these these megalithic structures, these megalithic pyramids as well. Uh, there are also pyramids in China. Uh, Nat Geo did a great uh, a great exploration of the lost pyramids of China. Yeah, that's great. It was a whole show that they created. It's kind of awesome. It goes back to I think two hundred and twenty something BC in search of pyramids from different warring kingdoms in China. And it appears that perhaps there were pyramids built kind of all over the place. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't seen the show yet, but I'm definitely interested. China's first emperor, the guy who got all of the various tribes and communities to form a cohesive nation, uh, pretty much bankrupted the country and oppressed thousands of people to build uh, some of the largest mortuary complexes mm-hmm. there was something about ancient kings where they thought you know what's really making it is having a big building that commemorates that i'm dead yeah just you got to make sure people remember that you existed after you're gone some people even have you know like some of the aristocrats had kitchens and toilets in these underground complexes i just don't get it I was talking to my mom the other day about like, you know, our family burial plot. And so I'm like, that is mom, that is depressing. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to think about that. Why do we have to like make these arrangements? Can't they just, you know, chuck us in a paper bag into the highway or something? Wrap you up in newspaper. Yeah. These things are important, son. And, you know, when you get a little older, you'll understand. (laughs) And so there are also pyramids in India, Indonesia, and Peru. Uh, There was for a time. And people who visit the state of Georgia or people who live in that state will find this interesting. For a time, there was a complex of pyramids here in our own state in Eatonton, Georgia. They were not ancient. No, and they're a little more modest in their size, but they were pyramids. They were built by a uh, religious group. I would hesitate to use the C word just because I don't, I, you know, I... I it's got a bit of a negative connotation. Yeah. We're yeah. not trying to look down on anybody for their beliefs, but they definitely had, an, let's say, a very particular set of mm-hmm. skills. Beliefs? <laughs> <laughs> of belief skills. The Nuwabians. Uh, the Nuwabian pyramids were constructed in the early 1990s on their compound, Tama Ray. And that is, again, in Eatonton, Georgia. I do want to say one thing that's interesting about the literature of this group is they have a uh, they have a linguistic practice where they take words and s- sort of switch them around into something that rhymes but they feel is more true to what the thing the object they're describing is mm-hmm. uh the example i remember most prominently is they don't say television they say tell lies vision that's Perfect. And there are like (laughs) dozens of words they use this. Unfortunately, uh, these pyramids are no more. Yeah, they don't exist anymore. It is a shame looking up some aerial shots of the whole compound right now. It's actually quite beautiful Mm -hmm. from a, you know, a helicopter. It's the whole thing, the way it's laid out is very purposeful. And then you've got the the pyramid surrounded by these almost like hedge maze looking pieces. Mm -hmm. And then all of the other plots are very kind of colored in such a way where the whole thing it looks almost like a face. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then you think that, you know, the government seized it mm-hmm. and then they tore the entire thing down. I have two thoughts. I, mm-hmm. I wish they would have left it. What's the story? For something. Well, the guy was arrested on some pretty heinous charges. And Child you, molestation. Yeah, you can oh. only imagine probably what went down, you know, near there or in some of those structures. Yeah. So. To be fair to the people who still adhere to Nuwabian beliefs, uh, there are a lot of ex-members, obviously, Mm -hmm. um, but they believe that their leader uh, was forced or is kind of was framed, was a Mm -hmm. setup. And that's despite uh, the Nuwabian leader is a fellow named Dwight York. Uh, He was charged with interstate transportation of minors for sex, 116 charges of child molestation. And uh, he was, okay, look, I'll say it. The Nuwabian is a black supremacist sect. So it subscribes to, um, it subscribes to some beliefs that 
you know, are racially tinged and therefore uh, reprehensible. Mm -hmm. But they also thought a spaceship would take the group away in 2003. It is 2017. I have not had contact with any of the Nuwabian folks. So perhaps some of them did make it on their ship. You know, this might even make a, a good podcast in its own light. Mm -hmm. They built, again, they built pyramids as religious structures, mm -hmm. right? But that brings us to another question. Why have such similar structures sprang up in unrelated cultures across the planet? We'll explore some of the answers or some of the theories after a word from our sponsor. So since the first missions to Antarctica early in the 20th century, there have been tales of a mysterious pyramid discovered Ooh. on this icy um, continent near the South Pole. Um, there were British explorers in the early 1910s who found a pointy rock and they named it uh, the pyramid and included it on their maps. So this formation is most likely the source of various Antarctic pyramids legends uh, throughout modern history. But uh, I'd just like to go here and go. say, oh, look at this chap. Oh, do you see that? It's pointing out of the ice there. <laughs> what does that look like to you? Oh, I declare that is that's a tad pointy, don't you think? Uh, quite pointy, much more pointy than I would expect here on this icy continent. <laughs> and then you take a big pull from your calabash. Uh -huh. <laughs> I say, mark that down, Jeffrey, as pyramid. <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> so, do you want to uh, do? Do you want it to be named after you, or perhaps your lovely wife? Um, uh, make it anonymous. <laughs> yes, py pyramid <laughs> shall suffice. And so, uh, and so, as we said, this, uh, you can imagine, right? It's understandable. It sounds a little weird today, but you can easily understand how uh, people return, right, from Antarctica, and they have these maps, and maybe the maps are reproduced, and then you get a hold of a map, and you're just a regular person, mm -hmm. and you're looking at this map of this mysterious unknown continent, and then you think, holy shnikes, a pyramid. Do people still say holy shnikes? For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, R.I.P. Chris Farley. Oh, it was Chris Farley. Oh, yeah, speaking of which, apparently I stole Skadoosh from Kung Fu Panda, and I'm okay with that because I was a big Tenacious D fan back in the day. For sure, and uh, I'm sure I heard Jack Black say something Skadooshy, you know, back in the old days when he was mm -hmm. on Mr. Show and Tenacious D. So I did not know that that was directly from Kung Fu Panda. I stand by it though, and it's it's just kind of a fun sound that sort of means like zippity doo dah, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of. Mm -hmm. That's it. I wasn't trying to rip off an animated has, has this been weighing on you? Yeah, it, it really has. has. It has. It's been I, pressing down on my soul. I remember one time when we were off air, you uh, we were meeting about something else, and then you stopped Matt and I, and you said, guys, I, I got to say something. And I didn't know what was going to come up. I was worried about you. Do you feel better? Do you feel lighter? I feel a little unburdened. Yeah, that's good. Man. Well, uh, write in and let Noel how much you're angry at him for stealing from the beloved Jack Black. He is quite beloved. Uh, and as always, we do have a special email for any complaints about the show. Your criticism is very important. Keep us honest uh, and just email us directly at Jonathan.Strickland at HowStuffWorks.com. Yeah, and really just feel free to mm -hmm. open it, open up and yeah. let us know how you feel. Again. That's Jonathan.Strickland at HowStuffWorks.com. Uh, so. Back to Antarctica. Back to Antarctica. <laughs> from, uh, from 2012 to 2016, there was this whole other round of rumors that were spreading about pyramids in Antarctica because there were photographs that got put online that showed something apparently sitting down there with these regular triangular sides. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to say, I saw these. I saw, you know, the Crystal Links links and mm -hmm. the UFO sites links that had right. these pictures, and I got super interested. But, you know, as we do on our show, you dig down a little deeper, and then you find the skeptic side, which throws salt on all my excitement. Uh, and, you know, they're saying that this is actually some kind of natural structure that got photographed at an angle that makes it feel even more mysterious. Which is similar to the old argument about the uh, 
face on Mars, mm-hmm. right? Is it just the angle of the photograph that makes a otherwise mundane topographical formation appear to be, you know, man-made and purposeful? Or, or are there buried pyramids out there, man? Maybe, maybe that's where, that's where civilization started was in Antarctica before it all iced over. What are you, some kind of hippie? I'm just saying. That's one of my favorite tropes in a lot of science fiction. Me too. That it, that moment about uh, two-thirds of the way through a sci-fi story where someone goes, we are the aliens. Yeah. Right before they get sucked out into space or Dude, something. you just spoiled every... Like, every single one. <laughs> I ruined every it. Every Shyamalan movie. I just, ruined it. Spoiled. Shut down the theaters. <laughs> but for me, the idea of an Atlantean civilization that existed, you know of some kind of intelligent life existing down there in Antarctica before everything froze over. I don't know. That just pulls me, pulls my heart. Well, we do know that we do know that there's a lot of stuff that historians got wrong over the years. And we know that history is still a a continuing conversation, right? There's no solid, widely accepted proof of a, global ancient civilization Mm -hmm. yet but that just that could just mean although it it may it may be implausible it could just mean that we haven't found something yet yeah but technology continues to advance Mm -hmm. and as lidar gets better ben we're gonna find some stuff i know it yeah i think so (laughs) oh i before we go on these these rumors that matt just mentioned they were uh linked with a couple of famous visitors to Antarctica. In late 2016, as the U.S. presidential campaign was uh, in in hot, hot heat, uh, John Kerry went to Antarctica in uh, November. And then just a... Just just to be clear here, it was for a Skull and Bones reunion. Yes. Um, They were hanging out in Antarctica at a research base. Meet me, Pointy Rock. (laughs) (laughs) We'll decide this like men. (laughs) Is it like a duel? Yeah, that's where the real election took place. Yep. <laughs> Pointy Rock, Antarctica. Uh, and just a short time later, in December of 2016, I think this one is interesting. This was just a rumor, okay? I haven't mm-hmm. confirmed it. This was just, uh, what's what's the word uh, Scalia used to use? Scuttlebutt. Yep. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, or what else did he do? He, the guy, regardless of what you think about him, the guy had a gift for obscure words. Was it the straight poop? Straight poop. We got an email about that too. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said argle bargle, which is a real word. I had to look hurly burly. Hurly burly is is that a real one too? I don't know. It works though. Hurdy gurdy man. <laughs> Hurdy gurdy man. Here comes the roly poly man. <laughs> Buzz Aldrin, astronaut, rumored again, just rumored to have tweeted, "We are all in danger. It is evil itself." Along with a picture of the alleged ice pyramid, Antarctic ice pyramid, and then he rapidly deleted it. Let's let's take a note here. Buzz Aldrin is notorious for his distaste for what he considers conspiracy theorists and for his sense of humor. It's also not obvious why somebody would fly Buzz out to Antarctica to investigate a pyramid. And one last thing here, mm. according to Snopes, yeah. that website that is loved and loathed by so many, it's it says this is false. Yeah. So okay, that's not that's just. But it doesn't mean it. Do, well, that that just means if you believe Snopes, then it's scuttlebutt. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, apparently, there are not astronauts traipsing about Antarctica. Uh, although the U.S. Uh, military did have some excursions there uh, in the World War II days. And if you are feeling like a lovely trip down a rabbit hole, uh, go ahead and hop on your preferred Internet search engine and type in Operation High Jump. Definitely. Mm. And just to stay on Aldrin for a moment, do you guys remember when he was on C-SPAN and he had that little, he mentioned that aside about the monolith on one of the uh, moons of Jupiter. Do you guys remember this? No. He actually says in his statement, I don't have an exact quote sitting in front of me, but a statement is like, when people see that monolith on one of the moons of Jupiter, they're going to say, 
where did that come from? Who built that? And then he just goes on with this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's no, pretty incredible. It's pretty crazy. And it's real. That. It's absolutely real. And so there are other theories. I, I think we should just jump to this theory. Some people, okay, so we can divide theories about pyramids into three rough buckets. Okay. There's the, the bucket of how were they built, right? Mm-hmm. And there's the bucket of what were they for? And then there's the other one, which is what do they do? Because some people, you know, people who believe in uh, sacred geometry, mm-hmm. for example, um, people, uh, there are people who believe that these shapes or the placement of these structures has some sort of significance in a, in a larger sense, right? Uh, you can find people who believe that the pyramids are built along ley lines, L E Y, mm-hmm. right? Which is sort of the belief in ley lines is the belief that the planet has something like its own nervous system and that these lines aggregate some sort of energy or power. Mm-hmm. People who have tested this feel that that is not scientifically valid, right? Mm-hmm. They say, okay, there's this accretion of energy or you stand in Stonehenge on the, the right time of the lunar year or the solar year and you you feel like there's some great thing happening, but uh, there's no measurement of it, right? There's no dif- There's no heat differential. There's not a massive geothermal vent or anything. We're definitely not fully discounting that, but we are saying there is no scientific evidence to prove uh, its existence. So let's bounce around these theories a little bit. Uh, Noel, I know you've been dying to talk about this. Yeah, grain. You'll, you'll know me. Where, where, <laughs> where, where does grain come into all this? Oh, did I mention that a couple, couple of times? <laughs> yeah, once you know. or twice, yeah. I wasn't trying to poke fun, but just a uh, fr- friend of the show, Ben Carson, <laughs> um, who I believe currently serves as our HUD secretary. Mm-hmm. Um, he came out during the campaign for president uh, with a, an interesting theory that that the pyramids were created by Joseph um, and his amazing Technicolor dream coat mm-hmm. to store grain. Yeah, that there were granaries. This in this belief uh, surprised a lot of people when. Uh, when Ben Carson said this, when Secretary Carson said this, because he uh, he was espousing uh, a belief that a lot of people had never heard before. It turns out medieval Europeans believed the pyramids were these granaries that were described in the Old Testament. And that's where the description of the pyramids is Joseph's granaries come from. It, it goes back to like the sixth century. So he wasn't just, you know, off the dome making a guess. Um this uh, this was in a book called History of the Franks by Gregory of Tours, and then it got popularized uh, by a book called The Book of John Mandeville. That was back when there were way fewer books, so you could just call the thing you wrote yeah. the book. <laughs> the book. book by me. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, his, uh, his main argument was that the pyramids were hermetically sealed um, and that you wouldn't need to hermetically seal a crypt. Um, But that would be something that would come in handy if you were trying to preserve grain. I've got a quote here from a BBC article uh, from an Egyptologist. Remember those guys? We talked about them. Mm -hmm. They exist. They're real. Don't condescend to the listeners. (laughs) One of them is named James Allen of Brown University. And he says, quote, there's no way in the world an ounce of grain would be stored in a structure like that. It would be totally impractical. It's like saying the Tower of London was built as a granary store. You could put grain in it then. I mean, so is a granary just any structure that contains grain? Essentially. Or that's used specifically. That's built con- for it. Yeah. So we could fill this studio with grain. But and that would, it wouldn't make it a granary because we didn't build it specifically for that purpose. I guess. But you also have to think about how does the grain get in? How do you get it out? Does it make right. sense? That's true. That's I true. mean, with a pyramid, it just doesn't make any sense. And there's another there's another idea here in 1859, a British publisher named John Taylor uh, wrote a book called The Great Pyramid, Why It Was Built and Who Built It. Uh, He said that. Noah, not the Egyptians, the biblical Noah, built the pyramid. 
because he built the ark and then he was therefore the most competent to direct the building of the pyramid. He also believes that the purpose of the pyramid, if we're going to a different theory, is to be a repository for the divine system of all mathematical truths. Whoa. Right? That's fun. What is that? Is that like a, like a, like a real fancy slide rule or something? Yeah, it's, it's an enormous slide rule because they couldn't get the moving parts for an abacus. Got it. They we're going to build a huge abacus. Uh, there are other people who believe that the Great Pyramid, uh, is predictive. Uh, there's a book called Our Inheritance of the Great Pyramid, also published in the 1800s, uh, revealed, to use, uh, to use our patented air quote, uh, revealed the date of the apocalypse. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's cool. Is it? Yeah, I mean, why not? If you could, you want to know? If you could glean the date, then maybe you can prevent it. What are you going to do about it? Drink more water and less soda. Wear more sunscreen. Yes. So we can see that a lot of the uh, more mm, out there theories about pyramids come from the, the pyramid craze in the 1800s, right? And a lot of them are religiously based. Uh, there are, of course, people who will say that pyramids were built by some diabolical force, right? An ancient evil or a demon. Uh, there is, of course, no proof of that. It, back in, in the time when a lot of these theories were propagated, people were sort of feeling around in the dark. Um, one of the interesting things that uh, probably interests a lot of people here is that for a long time, there was a fairly popular conspiracy theory of sorts that uh, – you know, a global civilization built all of these things mm -hmm. to to wit that Atlantis, the fabled lost civilization of Atlantis, built the pyramids. Uh, so let's look at the arguments of a fellow named Ignatius Loyola Donnelly. How's that for a name? That sounds great. Congressman from Minnesota uh, in the late 1800s. He argued this very point. Uh, he said. And that there once existed in the Atlantic Ocean, opposite uh, the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea, a large island was a remnant of a, another Atlantic continent known as Atlantis. Uh, he said that Plato's description, which is often taken to be a fable, was the straight poop, that it was actual history. Mm -hmm. uh, and that modern man first rose from barbarism to civilization in Atlantis, and then he said that the Atlanteans established colonies around the world. I mean, we've we've heard all of this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and at this point, we know that there have been ancient lost civilizations, but again, there's never been one big, you know, like one uh, people to rule them all found, sure. you know? Still, people love this theory. Oh, yeah. What do you guys think about the cargo cult theory of pyramids? Oh, that's interesting. So cargo cults, uh, which do exist, uh, cargo cults came from, uh, Polynesian islands, uh, out in the Pacific Ocean, where in pretty fairly isolated communities saw for the first time technology that they had never seen before, radio towers, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, airplanes, weapons of war, even clothing, even clothing of types, specific types. Of clothing. Yeah. That they had never seen before. And so, uh, they also would see these cargo drops, which would contain food and clothing, survival materials, stuff like that, humanitarian aid, for example. And so these cargo cults began uh, instituting religious practices, spiritual practices, wherein they would build uh, radio towers. Or an airplane. Yeah. Or, but it would be out of... Just stuff they available had around. materials. Yeah, it wouldn't be a, a flying. It would be a symbolic radio tower, a symbolic mm -hmm. airplane, and they would reproduce uh, or enact various um, ritualistic behaviors in hopes of, uh, in hopes of the cargo returning. One of these groups uh, worshipped Prince Philip. Oh wow! As a god, as a like, not as a cool guy, mm -hmm. not as just a regular dude. Uh, As it should be. Have you seen his jawline? 
I mean, you can break stunning, break walnuts and hearts on that jawline. <laughs> Right. So the the thing with this would be that the pyramids sprung up throughout the world in all these different developing civilizations because of some, in the ancient alien theory, some either ship that resembled a pyramid and then they were built like in memoriam in a way or to try and get them back down. You doing a Stargate thing here? Matt? It's essentially, well, kind of like a Stargate, but just, you know, a signal, a large enough signal that says, hey... Wherever you are up in the heavens, come visit again or come back to us. It's fascinating. So then it would be, oh, side note, the uh, the religious sect that we mentioned uh, is referred to as the Prince Philip movement. They're in an uh, island in Vanuatu called Tana. Nice. So if you are searching spiritually for something and you think you, you want to just try out a religion you have not heard of, then go ahead and uh, give, give the Prince Philip movement a go and let us know how it works out for you. So ancient aliens, we've mentioned this on the show before, and I feel like we'd be remiss if we didn't explore this a little bit because this ties into one of the conspiracies, not a theory, but one of the conspiracies that happened when Europeans began exploring possibilities of the origin for pyramids, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there are a couple things we should address here. First, a lot of the ancient alien theory stuff that exists now is descended from earlier, uh, earlier, very racially based theories, wherein uh, Europeans Maybe not the same guys who found the pointy rock in Antarctica, but uh, someone who, for the sake of argument, sounded very much like them, would see a pyramid and say, you know, this is remarkable. It, this is remarkable. Where, Where is the lost civilization of clearly white people who built this? Yeah, exactly. And so that, j just the same way that um, a lot of modern urban legends descend from earlier what we would call fairy tales right mm -hmm. um there's still that that folkloric progression or storytelling progression because history as we know is just one long game of telephone and we have to we have to consider that because the real the real cover-up at least one provable cover-up is that a lot of early explorers were searching for something that confirmed the belief they already had they had confirmation bias because not only did they not believe that native people could accomplish such tremendous works, but they didn't want to believe that. And if it were presented with proof, they probably would have just, if we know how confirmation bias works, they probably would have just doubled down on their idea. Exactly. That's what I always do. Mm -hmm. that, no, I mean, really, that is what we do <laughs> psychologically. Unfortunately, I. So these are these are some of the ideas. We do know that one provable cover up was uh, was either through negligence or malevolence. Where does this all lead us? You know, we've learned that <laughs> anything can arguably be a granary yeah. if you fill it with grain. Um, but that's kind of like saying that any any bag you put a sandwich in automatically becomes a sandwich bag. Yeah. You know? Uh, so we do know that there was one provable cover-up situation, and that occurred when earlier explorers from different parts of the world said, clearly, they didn't build this. Mm -hmm. They're lying, you see. And... I know that can be an ugly thing, but it happened. As for the state of pyramids now, the craziest thing to me is we still don't know how many are out there. We found the big ones. We found the big ones. And well, there are also pyramids that appear to be in protected areas where perhaps an insular government doesn't want any third party or NGO, you know, looking around to, mm -hmm. to find new ones that perhaps might be there or just covered up in jungle that we can't see unless we have highly sophisticated LIDAR mm -hmm. just going through the jungle acre by acre, which is 
a task that I wouldn't want to do. Well, I guess that wraps up the topic, but should we do some uh, some shouting outing, cornering? Absolutely. Tally ho. Shout out corners. Our first shout out today comes from Sean. Sean says, guys, I've loved this show up to your most recent episode. Your moving to Mars episode, I felt like it turned into a reading of, get this, guys, the Communist Manifesto. Whoa. Uh Uh-oh. Listen. Shots fired. (laughs) Listen, I get that political opinions of people sink into their work, intentional or unintentional. You're usually very good about presenting counter opinions, even if one of you is just playing devil's advocate. It was pretty sad to hear a conspiracy podcast advocating for more government. Wow. Well, I I can see what Sean is saying, mm-hmm. where there were definitely definitely some ideas that could be considered communist, and we pointed that out in the episode. Absolutely. Um, There's definitely a centralization of government. Sure. Which and, is not necessarily communism, but I don't think he's talking about just that, because there were other aspects there, too. Yeah, spreading out everything where everybody gets an equal share. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no real trading of goods for profit in this way they're just our goods and you get them Hmm. you know when the whole idea of like some greater power authority assessing your worth and giving you work assignment based Mm -hmm. on Mm -hmm. a series of algorithms that i guess look through your past work history and you know kind of tell you what you are and what you need to be doing yeah but we 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 talked about this even before we did the interview and, and maybe it didn't come across as much as we would have liked but these were things that we discussed when kind of like preparing for this interview. Yeah, I think one of, one of the things is when we're hanging out off air, we just for a peek behind the curtain, these episodes don't usually end for us when the episode ends on, you know, the the official episode the stream <laughs> that you're hearing. Yeah, yeah. because uh, we'll we'll sit we'll sit somewhere or we'll go somewhere after work and we'll still be talking about mm-hmm. the thing. And one of one of the things that we would say would be a difference between straight up Orthodox communism and what was being advocated here is that, uh, or what Marshall Brain was advocating was that this would be a technocracy. So instead of a Stalin or another strong man at the top who is still human, uh, there would be an artificial intelligence, which is almost scarier to me. (laughs) It's definitely I mean, unknown. Well, it's like who programs the artificial intelligence? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like where does that? It's like a chicken or the egg kind of question. But we also should point out that he said from the start this whole thing was a thought experiment. Mm-hmm. True, he wasn't necessarily advocating for any of this because he totally was like very adamant about the fact that this is pretty much impossible to yeah. even get there, to even have the mm-hmm. environment that would allow us to start such a society. And that's why it was a lot of fun for us to talk about because that's kind of what we like to do. Is mm-hmm you know, mm-hmm. get hypothetical with stuff and sort of play devil's advocate for big questions. And that's sort of this gave us that opportunity big time. And I, I, w- yeah. I would say, um, Sean Marshall, at the end of that episode, he gave his email address and he asked for people to write to him to oh, discuss. That's true, these things. Yeah. So if and actually I have forwarded him everything that's been written to us. Uh, specifically to conspiracy at how stuff works because uh-huh. he wants feedback. He wants to know what people think about some of this stuff. So sure, it's very much a work in progress, mm-hmm. as he said, and I I think that's. I'm glad you did that, Matt. Well, one of the things that I would like to explore in in a future episode would be the actual technology, nuts and bolts, because we didn't mm-hmm. really talk about that, right? And we have uh, <laughs> we have uh, received a lot of great questions about this. I'm laughing because one of them comes up in a later episode, and I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Yeah. Right. But it was a great question, and I'm still thinking about it. So thank you, Sean, and everyone else who wrote in regarding this topic. Uh, Marshall Brain is quite prolific, uh, and he does read every email he receives. And as he said, uh, he sincerely welcomes feedback. Our next shout-out comes from Justin. Send us an email. Justin says, good morning. I recently started listening to stuff they don't want you to know, and I'm enjoying it very much. Awesome, Justin. Thank you for listening and hanging out with us. I think you guys should do a cast on cryptocurrency. You could begin with discussions on Bitcoin, Mm -hmm. the leader, and then move on to companies that use the blockchain to solve problems in our everyday world. Mm -hmm. Take care, Justin. 
that's a that's a great topic. There's a lot to discover there on on my part at least. I'd need to do a lot of research. Uh-huh. <laughs> just to really wrap my head around how it all functions. I recently got uh, Coinbase, which is like this app that allows you to buy different cryptocurrencies. Whoa. Um the whole thing's fascinating to me. And we have actually some colleagues at work who bought into Bitcoin back in the day yeah. before it kind of boomed mm -hmm. and actually I won't name names, but sold it before it boomed hard. At a loss. He would have been a Minor millionaire. If, he, if he, he, he or she. <laughs> he, he or she. Or she. At the very least, 100,000 there. But point being, the history of cryptocurrency in yeah. of itself is really cool. And the mm -hmm. whole Mt. Gox thing and, you mm -hmm. know, all of that is its own stuff. And then, like, how it's being used now and the black market aspects of it and the deep web. Totally it, great episode for it, that. And yeah. some mysterious inventor stuff is in there still, mm -hmm. right? And the future cashless society that we're running mm -hmm. up on. Future? I don't know. We're getting so close. Yeah, you'll just have to buy credits and have them put on your wristbands so that you can scan them. Psh, like more like a, your like implant. Like at a music festival. <laughs> They're going to alter your DNA so that every cell you, every cell in your body reflects how much worth you have. Doesn't that sound like a personal hell? Like uh, the world is just one big music festival? Yeah, it's just yeah. terrible. Yeah, well, if it was Bonnaroo, then for sure that is mud, that is, mud everywhere. Oh. I mean, developing countries are increasingly cashless and in that – Wait, our previous episode on whether money is a religion, I really had us thinking about that too. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it doesn't, it, it's not attached to a commodity directly right. now. So it, it's an idea. It's out in the ether. <laughs> it requires faith. It requires a <laughs> massive amount of faith. And we got some cool emails about that one too. We should yeah. bring up another time. Absolutely. Uh, you're, got, you're so right. Just yeah. I would just want to say you're so right about the music festival thing being a test run, essentially, of how it would <laughs> function when it's you get meant in to there. Be like a little village, like a, like a society, you know, where we're all just living and loving, listening to string cheese incident and hemorrhaging money, hemorrhaging money on fifteen dollar Red Bull and vodkas. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't even have to have alcohol. It's anything is at least ten dollars. Yep, you know? right, right. Just yeah. A hot dog, five dollar waters. Mm -hmm. Plus four four dollars for bun service. That's where they give you a hot dog bun. <laughs> okay. Start charging for the mud before you know it. You know? Oh, yeah, no. But uh, but it is true. It is a microcosm of society. So this is fascinating. All right, we got one last one from Anthony. Just finished watching your latest video on Elisa Lamb's mysterious disappearance. Staying on the topic of disappearances, have you guys looked into the thousands of cases of national park disappearances? Ho, 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 ho. Huh. Huh. Ho, Interesting ho, ho. you should say that, Anthony. Uh, most notable, David Pilates in his book series. He also recently released a short documentary about it that would make for an interesting topic to play. It's all... This is a very prescient email, you guys. Yes, right? so I'm going to leave it at that. But just yes, yeah. and yes, and, and to, to quote our boss Jason Hoke, stay tuned. The book series, uh, the book series Anthony's referring to is Missing Four One One, as well as the documentary that is now available. Mm -hmm. So yes, as as uh, my colleague here said, stay tuned. And that concludes our. <laughs> But not our show. That is right. Matt, Noel, and I will be returning next week with something com probably completely different. Than pyramids? Yes. <laughs> yep. Okay. We're uh, going to talk about a different shape. Yes. Uh, yep. It's going to be a trapezoid. Rhomboidal. <laughs> Perhaps. You Do never know. Dodecahedrons. What if there are no angles? What if it's just a formless mass of jelly mm -hmm. what if it's non-euclidean uh alien lovecrafty and geometry right and yeah. just looking at it drives you mad isn't that sort of what spawned you <laughs> i mean i you know i don't talk about my personal life That's on the show yeah. it, it could be <laughs> any number of things it might even be government continuity who knows it may well be uh but Either way, we hope that you do tune in and we hope that you find it interesting. In the meantime, if you were like, this was not enough strange, weird stuff for this week, where do I find more before next Friday? We have just the place for you. If you'd like to learn more about ancient technology, lost civilizations, mysterious structures, visit our website, stufftheyonwantyouknow.com, where you can find every audio podcast we have ever done. And, if you want to find us and that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, 
You can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.